Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's seminar. We are seeing people coming in. Um, so um, thanks for being here in the first place. We are very, very happy to see you all with us today. Uh, my, if you don't know me already, this is the third uh, instance of this seminar series. Um, but uh, my name is Luca Raimondi. I am a Marius Glodosta Curie Research Fellow at King's College London uh, in the English department. And with me today are Professor Anania Kabir, um, also from the English department, and Dr. Arunima Patacharya from the University of Leeds. Um, so as I was uh, just, just please look at all of you coming. Um, um, as I was saying, this is the third seminar um, on the theme of Archipelagic Indias, um, a series that Ananya and I are curating within the series of seminars run by the King's India Institute. Um, and so we thank them, first of all, very much for their collaboration and for their hospitality. Um, just to um, briefly introduce or reintroduce the series. Uh, so the purpose of this mini series uh, for, for Anani and I was in the first place to explore the, the history, the culture uh, and the stories, listen to the stories of those archipelagic spaces, which um, geographically speaking are uh, surely peripheral to the uh, Indian mainland, um, the subcontinent, uh, strict or sense of, um, but, but that uh, have also been made peripheral uh, from a cultural and from a political point of view. So for us to mobilize, to use uh, the, 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 the word, the notion of archipelago and of archipelagic in the title is not because we are, of course, referring to the geo, geo, geology of the, of the places that we're interested in, um, but we also want to foreground um, the idea of relationality that is embedded in, in, archi in the archipelagic theory specifically. And so um, kind of uh, lead us all to think beyond those lineal narratives of historical, national, and cultural belonging and development. Um, in the first two seminars of this series, we, we, we already exp started exploring uh, two of these archipelagic spaces, the Andaman Islands, um, with uh, Dr. Shazi Rahman from the University of Dayton, um, who um, presented a reading on a, a novel by a Pakistani writer, Uzma Azlam Khan. And uh, in December, Dr. Bindu Menon from Azim Premji University introduced us to the media uh, scape, the media imaginaries of the Lakshadweep. Now, for the second part of the series uh, in March, uh, we return to these places, but uh, with two other guests uh, who will uh, give us a whole different reading and uh, who take, bring to us different stories of these, uh, of these islands and these archipelagos. So today uh, we have Arunima uh, Bhattacharya, and she will take us back to the Andaman Islands where we uh, started uh, with a talk uh, titled Anthropology, Silence and Water, Andaman Islands in Recent Indian Novels. Um, I will now briefly introduce Arunima. Um, Arunima um, uh, has a PhD in English Literature from the University of Leeds, and she is now a postdoctoral research assistant at the same university in the School of History, uh, working on the AHRC funded project, The Other from Within, Indian Anthropologists and the Birth of a Nation, which sounds super fascinating. Uh, her research interests include colonial and post-colonial urban heritage, mobility and travel literature, and Indian Ocean networks of people and trade in the long 19th century. So the format that we will follow today is pretty much the same as uh, we did in the past. Arunima will speak for around half an hour. She will also be presenting using uh, a PowerPoint presentation with beautiful images. Uh, and then her talk will be followed by a short response from um, Ananya, from Professor Ananya Kabir. And we will then open up for Q&A. Uh, 
Um, if you have any questions um, also during the presentation and you just don't want to sort of miss them, forget them, you can write them in the chat box. I will collect them and they will be addressed at the end. Um, uh, or you can just stay, stay on until the end and uh, raise your hand uh, or um, ask your question in the chat box right at the end. Um, if you have to leave earlier um, just just know that the seminar is being recorded and it will be uploaded on youtube along with all of the other past seminars and the next one at the end of march uh, on the um king's oh my gosh i forgot the global affairs youtube uh channel of king's king's college london um i think it's all from me um i see quite other few people uh, joined us i'm very happy now to uh leave the floor to uh Abrunima. okay thank you luca i'll just share my screen first yes and to probably Arunima, maybe you can uh, uh, make it, um, you know, the slideshow view, so we'll see the entire thing. You see, see what I mean? Okay, okay. Yes. Uh, maybe don't Sorry. see the slides and just. Um, it will be the little TV looking, TV like icon. Yeah, I think it has gone under this thing, you know, the header for the Zoom thing, so I can't yeah. see it right now. Uh, no big deal. We can see the slide perfectly well. It was just, you know, because we, I know I often forget to do that final step myself. So if it's, a, if it's you know, if it's not clear, I mean. Okay, I'll just stop sharing and uh, share again and I'll do it from my screen. Just a second. Ritama is giving Here us some go. very complex, uh, to me at least, they yeah. sound very complex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it doesn't matter. We'll do, we'll, we'll, we are very happy to see whatever. There yeah. is it. Yeah, there it is. Oh, yeah, lovely. Great. Thank Yay. You. <laughs> Thank you, Ritama. <laughs> yes, I just couldn't see the thing. Okay. So, first, um, first of all, I need to say that I have changed the title, as you can see. I don't know if you can see it, uh, but uh, it's uh, Anthropology, Silence and Waters, but writing Andaman Island. So, I didn't want to keep Indian novels in the title because one of them is not an Indian writer. So, that's something that I have changed. And this is the structure of today's talk. I'll, I'll be reading out from a screen, so I'll be looking this way. But yeah, my attention is on you. So thank you, Luca, and thank you, Ananya, and the King's India Institute for this kind invitation and the brilliant opportunity to share my work here today. Uh, this work follows on certain strands that emerged from a doctoral thesis and my current work in South Asian anthropology. Um, this work is part of a larger project that reads literary and historical works on the Andaman Islands to interrogate the makings of Indian nation through the investigation through investigating the relationship between legacies of empire, climate justice, and indigenous survival. I will introduce myself and this project a bit, and then I will get, go into the structure of the talk and the various sections of it. So this is the project that is more or less on Andaman Islands. Um, in colonial administrative ethnographies, the travelogues and Andaman the Andaman Islands in the Bay of Bengal were seen as a fecund field for anthropological study and colonial settlement, and were reorganized as a penal colony in the aftermath of the 1857 mutiny. In the post-colonial period, the islands have been popularly imagined as a tropical tourist paradise. And when I say paradise, I mean it with all its ironic implications. It is only in the last decade that literary works on the islands have emerged, which have begun rethinking the islands as an archipelago. Thinking through archipelagic interconnectedness, interconnectedness geologically, geopolitically, and culturally, the novels have called for recalibrating our imagination regarding nation, national culture, and peripherality. Their authors have thereby insisted on the important link between island ecologies, indigenous life systems, and mainland state policies. 
My project draws from existing scholarly developments in archipelagic thinking that interrogate the territorialized conceptions of post-colonial nation state and the collective identities it generates to understand the Andamans, which have not received sustained literary critical attention. It does so by looking at the anthropological and sociological research on the island and its community histories that have originated in colonial extractive policies and have discursively structured the archipelago's indigenous communities and environment as primitive, exotic, and enclosed, mainly framed into a carceral imagination, foregrounding the cellular jail, making the islands cartographically and discursively peripheral to the mainland nation in popular imagination. And I will refer to some of these writers, of course, like Satatru Sen, Claire Anderson, Uditi Sen, and as holding a place for displaced refugees from the partition of India. That is uh, Uditi Sen's work on this area. I will argue that literary authors have offered an alternative imagination of nation and its periphery by showing how these sociological discourses of peripherality have worked through centuries. They have done so by foregrounding the materiality of the islands themselves, establishing the archipelago centrality in the subcontinent politics during the end of the Second World War and the political conception of the newly formed nation states of India and Pakistan. They stretch the temporal and spatial frontiers of the islands to interrogate the uh, unidimensional conception of colonial power structures in order to include the complicated history of the Japanese invasion in the Andaman Islands of the Andaman Islands and the remained that remained a strategic threat to mainland India during 1942 to 45 when it was recaptured by the British and they went back in 1946. The fiction does so by focusing on the underlying geology of archipelagos that connect what on the surface seem scattered landmasses in the ocean. It invests in making visible through discourses of deep time and tectonic shifts, a longer history of connected ecologies, natural disasters and climate vulnerability. Secondly, the archipelagic interventions into the discursive conception of islands as peripheral and scattered compared to the situated connectedness of the mainland that is the Indian subcontinent. Drawing from Epili Haupa's Our Island, Our Sea of Islands, this project seeks to interrogate the territoriality, territorially rooted conceptions of identity within the nation state paradigm and manifest the possibility of thinking through flu fluid conceptions of collective time and identity that are distinct but connected as suggested by island geographies. Further, written by female authors from different countries focusing on female protagonists, these novels question the masculine representation of the islands in the virgin and ex as virgin, exotic, and thus needing to be populated through settlement and penal colonies. Finally, reading literature will raise the problematic question of who writes and for whom. Here, Using novels as a genre, which have been associated with the rise of modern nation states and bourgeois capitalism, it will help us to set an alternative understanding of temporality and nationhood. An ancillary aspect of, the, of this conceptualizing or conceptualizing the archipelagic is to look at creolization as cultural manifestation of the archipelagic, which interrogates territorially grounded and stable or compact conceptions of authentic national imaginaries. Now, this is the scope of the project, and I'm not sure how much of it I'll be able to cover in this talk, but I'll definitely try to bring it into my discussions of the text that I've chosen today. And I have I will be talking about Shivangi Swarup's book and uh, Amy Liu's book, and I've left Nomi Ali out because there has already been a talk on this, and it was beautifully and efficiently read, so I'm not going into that book today. Um, so the structure of the talk generally is that I'll be talking about the history of the Andaman Islands as setting and why the setting is essential to a distinctive reading of island history in relation to the Indian nation territory. Anthropology and geological time, temporality is a big aspect of what I'm going to talk about today as two vectors that condition the temporality of the narrative and aesthetic modes of the novels. And reading the novels for non-compliant islands, uh, continuity and flow, language and silence, these are the subheadings of the slides that I'll be reading with textual examples. Uh, so to begin with the, you know, setting some context for this talk, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are the largest archipelagic system in the Bay of Bengal, consisting of about 306 islands and 206 rocky outcrops. And I think you can see it uh, over here. I have just kept the bigger picture so that you see 
where it's actually located in relation to India and the surrounding countries. So only 38 of these islands are inhabited. Of these, 11 are in Andaman group and 13 in the Nicobars. This large archipelago is separated from the mainland from mainland India by about 1,200 kilometers. The nearest landmass in the, is in the north, the Myanmar, Burma, 200 kilometers away. And the closest landmass to the Great Nicobar in the south is the Sumatra or Indonesia, located at a distance of 145 kilometers. The islands of the archipelago lie in a crescent that stretches from Cape Negria, Myanmar, to the Banda Arc of Sumatra, Indonesia, down here. The Andamans are considered to be the extensions of the submerged Arakan Yoma mountain range of Myanmar, while the Metanwi Island, Mentawi Island to the south and southwest of Sumatra are presumed to be the southern continuation of the Nicobars. And I've taken this information from Pankaj Seksario's book, Islands and Floods. And as Ethi Abraham puts it, and I quote, given the physical distance that the islands have from India, it is not unreasonable to argue that the Andamans are a Southeast Asian land that belongs to India. This is one of the basic premises of my talk today. Um, this is the islands in, you know, zoomed in, and you can see like the fact that there is a sort of elevation of the ocean floor and therefore the whole idea of the Arakan Yuma Mountains and these being a continuation of the Himalayan range, the mid-oceanic, mid you know, fault line so as to say, over which the islands occur. Okay, so before I go into the authors, I'll just start with this first. Uh, this is the timeline that I have for the Andaman Islands today. Actually, I'll introduce the authors first. So this is uh, Shivangi Swaroop's book. I have just included the blurbs from her book to give you all an idea of what the book is about, if in case you have not read it, and I highly recommend you read it because it's beautifully written. So it has, as you see, got a lot of international uh, attention as well as national. It has got several awards. It's been translated into several languages already. And I will be giving you a summary of the novel later on. So this is just an introduction to how the author looks, how the, you know, the beautiful cover of the book as well. It's published in 2019 by HarperCollins. Uh, this is the other book, Amy Liu's book. It, uh, it's based on 1942, the Japanese invasion. And this is the blurb which kind of summarizes the novel. So I'll just read it out here just in, you know, for reference later on. And it begins with the Japanese invasion uh, of the Andaman Islands. And after five years in the remote Andaman Islands, a spring aspiring anthropologist Claire Durant and her husband Shep, a civil surgeon, must evacuate with their beloved but mysteriously mute four-year boy, boy Tai. They cannot, however, take Nyla, the local girl whose ability to communicate with Tai has made them dangerously dependent on her. The morning of the evacuation, both children disappear. With time running out, Chef forces Claire onto the ship while he stays behind to find their son. But just days after landing in Calcutta, Claire learns that the Japanese have taken down the months and cut off all access to her missing family. In the desperate odyssey that follows, Claire, Shep, and Nyla will all take unimaginable risks while drawing deeply from their knowledges of the unique islands to save their beloved glorious boy. So that's the plot of Glorious Boy. Now going into the history of the Andaman Islands before we link them to the novels themselves. It begins with the early attempts um, at colonization. So here, of course, the early first one was by John Ritchie, who arrived on the Andaman Islands, stopping in, in a channel that he named Diligent Strait. Ritchie did not have any particular interest in the Andamans. He was conducting a survey of the Ganges Delta and Bay of Bengal, charting anchorages for the energetic British maritime project expanding out of eastern India and Malaya. It was followed in 1789 by Archibald Blair, arrives in the island sent by Governor General Lord Cornwallis on a two year survey. Now Blair did not come merely to chart, he came to found the colony. And I'm reading here from um, Aparna Vedic mostly. The settlement eventually named Port Cornwallis numbered several hundred men, women and children, sailors, soldiers, convicts, laborers, overseers, tradesmen and administrators. Yet within six years of its creation, the colony was finished. All the settlers were evacuated in 1796, as you can see towards the end of the slide, leaving minor ruins that would be sources of romantic pleasure to men who came later. The official reason for abandonment was the location was too unhealthy for settlement to be viable. The official, and this has been contested in later historical, you know, 
critical um, appraisals of this period. Readings. The official uh, directive to Blair and Kidd, who was the person who followed him, Alexander Kidd, explicitly was to reject any civilizing agenda and that might extend the scope and scale of the colony. There were only there were only reminders in the official directives that the colonizers must themselves remain civilized. The path to follow accordingly was to create a settlement that clings to the edge of the jungle rather than grows into the jungle, a minimally invasive and separate world. The colonists could neither ignore the indigenous nor engage with them with consistency or purpose. The Andamanis remained the blackness at the edge of the colony, here I quote, as much as a sea of and the jungle. And these indigenous communities constituted a boundary of the beach and a limit of the colonizers' abilities. And you can actually read more about this idea of the beach being secluded in a midway, a liminal space between the ocean and the island in Sathya Drusen's work. So the sickness that kind of led to the you know, end of this particular first colony, so as to say, was more that drove the colony and you know, caused it to disperse was both in terms of health of individuals, but also a structural malaise of the colony. Aparna Vedic in Imperial Andaman's colonial encounter in island histories argues that it was really the displacements, vicissitudes and transformations in the mid 19th century Indian Ocean politics that catalyzed the historical destiny of the Andamans. According to Vedic, the story of the Andamans is not to be mistaken as a legitimation of genealogies of contemporary globalization or for a colon colonial history repackaged as ocean-based world history, a global history of connectivity. The colonization of the islands was part of a long-standing British strategy of controlling Indian Ocean waters dating back to the late 18th century. Colonization midwived the birth of the Andamans on the oceanic navigational and survey maps, international trade routes, and in anthropological and ethnographic monographs. It symbolically replotted the Andamans on the imperial map, not as a segment of the Southeast Asian archipelago, but as a frontier outpost of the empire in India. The ancient and medieval maps charts the navigational texts that hitherto nearly always located the Andamans as a, past, as a part of the Southeast Asia in line with Java and Sumatra. But this changed and it became like the border of the eastern border of the British Indian state uh, or empire. In geographical terms as well, the Andamans were an extension of the Indo nation archipelago, which was overridden. The colonial map making, however, repositioned and appropriated the territory of the Andamans into the pantheon of imperial frontier conquests. Instead of looking eastwards, the Andamans now reoriented, were reoriented to face the Indian subcontinent. Where this reading helps uncover the way global connections contributed to the historical marginalization of the Andamans. Now here in this particular slide, you'll see that in 1858, it starts with what's the, you know, the survey team that comes into Andaman and then it, follows with the setting up of the cellular jail. And in 1909, the imprisonment of the Indian revolutionaries and political prisoners of the cellular jail led to the nationalist edification of the islands. So it kind of begins with the 1858 uh, prisoners of the first war of independence for taken to the islands, the prison being built, and then it was ultimately made to house the, you know, the people, the Indian revolutionaries. Uh, since 1909. The islands as a penal colony connected to separate phases of the international movement, the 1909 law tracing back to prisoners brought in earlier in 1857. And then the imperial, you know, sort of Japanese and then the British, the World War phase begins in 1941, the Japanese occupation of the Andamans and the British return to it in 1946. Mm. There's a lot of like, it ends with this uh, 1947, the climax of nationalist expro uh, expropriation of the Andamans came with Lord Mountbatten, Viceroy of India, handing over the Andamans to Jawaharlal Nehru, the prime minister of independent India in 1947. In Nehru's perception, these islands were sacred symbols of Indian nationalist struggle and therefore where to naturally go with the un Union of India. So we have sort of like two opposing portrayals of the islands. One is the Kalapani in the British colonial imagination, like for example, Arthur Conan Doyle's The Sign of Four, written in 1890, replete with imageries and fantasies, which were part of colonial folklore regarding the Andaman Islands, disease, morbidity on the islands, horrible lives led by the convicts, and the presence of cannibalistic natives armed with poison darts and blowpipes. 
as opposed to this kind of imagery, so there's this whole Indian collective national memory about it based on Mukti, Mukti Tirtho, or the site of pilgrimage for freedom, where the sons of Bharat Mata or Mother India sacrificed their lives in the service of the nation. And the book, there's a book on this that Vijay Kumar Sen has memoir, nine years he spent as a prisoner in the Saluda jail in Andamans, the Indian Bastille. The nationalist appropriation of the Andamans was part of the larger process of the reconfiguration of colonial space as national space. The Andamans was not the promised land nor or the remembered land of Indian nationalism. It was a redemptive space of Indian nationalism, the sacred pilgr pilgrimage sanctified by the dust of martyrs' feet. So in a sense, the political prisoners and the later move that allowed for you know, migration of convicts and non-convicts to the island post 1950s, physically, physical torture, violence as history and heritage, both British and Japanese becomes a legacy of these islands. And in India, post-independence, the events that kind of commemorate this is the Andaman Divas or the Andaman Day, every celebrated every year on March 10th. And uh, by the local Andaman administration. The state commemorates the landing of the rebels of the revolt and the inauguration of the penal settlement on the island soil. Another instance of the conversion of the cellular jail by the government of India into a national memorial. That's another instance of nationalizing the space is 1969. It was turned into a national memorial, the cellular jail, as a result of the efforts of the ex-Andaman political prisoners fraternity circle. So as a sort of a conclusion to this, like we can begin with, um, you know, the beginning of the anthropological survey of India and its work in the Andaman Islands. Uh, it was first set up in 1948. Uh, it was uh, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands Regional Station as a survey and survey office in Port Blair in 1951. And there's a lot of work regarding the way the anthropological survey has kind of framed its attitude towards um, the Andaman Islands, but a significant part of it actually comes across in Itya Brahm's uh, sort of writing on the island, and I'll read out a bit from there. The powerful anthropological survey of India still clinging faithfully to the purity pollution code identified by Louis Dumont and the British social anthropology as was was the, this was the essence of the Indian society, confirmed that the islands were both a melting pot and a frontier. Um, and I quote here, where rigidities of the type that exist on the mainland in commensal and connubial relations are generally not observed, where there is no untouchability and where intercommunity marriages are common. So this was interpreted as this kind of, you know, sort of a paradise where caste system did not exist because it was beyond that, it was somewhere in the future where we had overcome these you know, hierarchical distinctions. In official eyes, the common culture produced by creolization of the Andamans had created a uniquely hybrid society that had been broke, that had broken with all the characteristic traits and practices associated with Hindu India, beginning with religion and extending to language, caste hierarchy, marriage, and food. However, the indigenous inhabitants of the Andamans, as their distinctive place and history in the island comes under question from more recent arrivals who were busily redefining the normative terms of what it means to be Indian and Andamanese. What is missing from this whole uh, discourse is the record and the accounts that locate the Andamans in relation to nearby Myanmar, Thailand, and Indonesia, as well as narratives that begin by acknowledging the islands as a global maritime junction, rather than reducing it to the remote possessions of the Indian mainland or the metropolitan centers. The tensions emergent from the lack of fit between the profoundly multi-ethnic and imperial history and the post-colonial expectations of social and cultural homogeneity in an Indian nation space can now be seen as an immanent problem of boundary making in this region. So shifting from this you know, background of what is happening in terms of how the Andamans are being you know, sort of used as a way of, um, as part of military strategy in the Pacific uh, Indian Ocean region, also as part of how it is defined as the border of the Indian nation, though it is obviously more, you know, in tune with geographically, geologically, with the Southeast Asian uh, archipelago, all these situations come to bear upon how these novels that I'm going to read, or, you know, novels that have been published in the last decade, have dealt with the islands, have tried to kind of change the story. 
Um, in case of Swaroop and Liu, both authors provide an intense focus on the local and regional that paradoxically offsets the way Andamans were at once marginalized in the greater imperial discourse. And also, however, as a symbolic import, and this follows from the symbolic import of Mount Patton's handing over the Andamans to Nehru. It suggests that it was a central piece in the layout of imperial oceanic domination in the Indian Ocean zone that had reached back into the 1780s, since the first colonial missions to this place. What these three novels published in April 2019, that is Nomi Ali, Shubhangi's book in 2018, and 2020, Glorious Boy Do, is center Andaman Island speaking to a crucial moment in Indian history and challenge rewrite its constructed peripherality in terms of the territorial conceptions of the nation. It also focuses the narrative beyond the cellular jail and into the ecology of the island settlement that seems to be a world in its own with ontology of being and existence that escape beyond the rigor of language that categorizes and the categorizing structures of the civilized world. Um, set in the diverse geological and ecological space of India, Swaru poetically explores one of the geographical aspects, the geographical aspect of time, dividing the novel into four loosely connected chapters that each follow a different set of protagonists. The chapters are named accordingly, Islands, Fault Line, Valley, and Snow Desert. The novel covers the ecology of Eastern Indian tropical islands, the abuse of Burmese political detainees and the icy heights of no man's land in Karakoram Mountains, the Shiachan Glacier, at the border between India and Pakistan. Now, this is the first excerpt from the novel, but before that, before actually we can read through this and then I can get to describing what's, what's in it. Um, although the islands give their name to the surrounding Andaman Sea that was as compliant as they got, Hence here behaved like pigeons, roosting on mango trees, airborne butterflies drifted into sleep, floating down like autumn leaves. For the longest time, no one could colonize the islands. For the impenetrable thicket hid more than just natural history. It hid tribes left behind by the original littoral migrations across the Indian Ocean. People who preferred to read minds over abusifications of language and clothed themselves in nothing but primitive wrath who were equipped with only bows and arrows to fend off the syphilis of civilization. Their world was a giant island held together by mammoth creepers, not gravity. In an interview, Swarup describes her novel thus, a tectonic fault line is the narrative thread of my novel. And when you shift your gaze this way, a very different story emerges. One, where natural history is the framework to our lives, not political borders or artificial plots. In a different interview, she calls this mid-oceanic ridge or fault line her Sutradhar. In Swarup's novel, and here I quote from Judith Ran, non-human alongside the human is a changeable, interconnected, and most of all, agentic force that has tremendous influence on human life. The fault line is a structure which brings together the vastly different time scales of the planet and the human character in this novel. What from a distance appears as sudden and abrupt event, like a sudden abrupt event that shift the course of the character's lives and situations, like for example, the earthquake that is mentioned in the first section of the novel on the Andamans, that tears through the Andaman Islands, changing its geography and tilting it from its axis, or the tsunami that ravages its shores years after, are actually connected to the same geological matter out of which the islands emerged. Though for its human characters, they are catastrophes that are different, that connect different generations through sorrow, loss, and displacement. Swarup's novel, though mainly set on the Indian land, traces its characters' journeys to the territories of Burma, Nepal, and a no man's land between India and Pakistan in the section titled Snow Desert, which is based on the Tibetan plateau. The interconnected fluidity of the Earth's surface itself renders stable identifications and meaning making implausible and challenges the wisdom of accepted conventions as one of the many possibilities that exist. The novel, therefore, completely decenters the territorial assumptions of the Indian nation state. In the, in the section on the Andamans, Swarup brings the Oxford-educated, scientific-minded Girija Prasad, a meticulous botanist 
and his newly wed wife, Chanda Devi, a gold medalist in mathematics and Sanskrit to the archipelago of the Indi Andaman Islands, just after India gained independence from British and the islands were still recovering from the aftermath of World War II. Grija Prasad's scientific investigations into the geology of the islands and the incredible life forms is complemented and oftentimes staggered by the supernatural abilities of Chanda Devi to intuit the future, absorb the wisdom of trees, and communicate with ghosts of the island who are sad remains of the repeated colonial occupation of the islands and its carceral legacies. I'll just read through these quotes to just kind of go back to the idea of continuity and flow that is based on the geology of the place itself. So when Girija Prasad first came here, he arrived believing in half-truths, like no man is an island. It has taken him a year to realize that no island is an island either. It is part of that great geological pattern that connects all the lands and oceans of the world. Half a mile away from his home, he found a living plant that was previously only seen as a fossil in Madagascar and Central Africa. Again, taking us back to continental drift, which is a major idea in the first section of the novel. It may just be a possibility, replies Girija. And here is a conversation between Girija Prasad and Chanda Devi, who says that it feels like sitting on top of a mountain in the Himalayas, if only not for the sound of the sea that she can hear. And Girija Prasad replies, it may just be a possibility. I read in the academic paper, claimed that the volcanic islands of Indonesia and the Mansi are a continuation of the Himalayas. We are sitting, so to speak, on mountain peaks arising from the ocean floor. I find it hard to believe, though it's plausible. And I'll end with this one. Only fools would consider the shores of continents, sandbanks, and parched patches the ends to an unbroken surface of water. At best, they are breaks or pauses or mindless chatter. Islands are mindless chatter in a meditative ocean. So in the following quotes uh, about silence and you know, language, I will talk now, this is part of the way water is sort of brought into the conversation. I will talk about time and water in the novel. Water is the element of time in this novel. The opening pages of the novel evoke the wetness of the tropical island caught in the incessant rain. And we see how it has subsumed the inner life of the husband and wife as well, Girija and Chanda Devi. Glaciers, now the whole novel actually has a lot of water in it, different forms of it. And that is why it's sort of like glaciers freeze into oceans, glaciers are frozen oceans, oceans dry up to form deserts with fossils of sea creatures, mist turns into rain that feeds rivers that then floods their shores in Burma. And then there are there is a tsunami also in the novel. So water embodies the emotions of each of the sections, the ocean in the first, the rivers and glaciers in the following sections. It brings together in its malleability, the different time scales of geological deep time and human lifetimes. Um, this is the opening sentence of the novel. Silence on a tropical island is the relentless sound of water. The waves like the sound of your own breathing never leave you. For a fortnight now, the gurgle and thunder of clouds has drowned out the waves. Rains drum on the roof and skid over the edge, losing themselves in splashes. Simper, whip, thump, and slip. The sun is dead, they tell you. The newly married Girija Prasad and Chanda Devi have resigned to their fate, strangers in a bedroom damp with desire and flooded with incipient dreams. The rains are conducive to fantasies and unscientific truth. So you see the first, these are the first two paragraphs. So you can imagine how, you know, the language itself is taken on the element of water. And this has been pointed out in you know, the recent research on this novel as well. Water is the connecting element of the novel that forces all human and non-human life to interact with the, and position themselves towards it. Seated in the sound of an elemental silence, the quietness of mist and the stillness of ice. And that is how the novel moves as well. Uh, time sort of congealing into ice, flowing like river, uh, coming down with the force of rain. That is how the novel differentiates between different moods, the emotional geographies of it, the emotional climate of the novel, so as to say. Now, just to connect this idea of silence and water to the other novel that we have in this discussion, and I'm rushing through over here, I'm not sure how much time is left, but uh, the second novel, which is Amy Liu's book, uh, The Language of Silence. And the 
I have titled it as the language of silence because here I'll just focus on this part. So as I've told you earlier, this book has one, one of the main protagonists of the book is Claire, who is an anthropologist, and she has come with her husband, who is a botanist, to um, Andaman Islands with their little boy, Tai. And Claire is really interested in getting to know the languages of the island, particularly from the indigenous tribes. And she here is talking about the Bia tribe. And I'll just read this part a bit and then get to uh, how it links back to the idea of silence. The second challenge was the Bia's entirely separate nonverbal language to explain Leo, Leo gestured with his palm to his crown, then his chest. Spirit talk is for head, for heart, silence. Still we hear. Among the Bia people, if Claire understood him correctly, the silent spirit talk was valued more than the language of words. The language of the spirit was communal and empathic. empathic. It was also the language of nature. Leo told her, he noticed in Port Blair that neither Europeans nor Indians could speak the spirit language. But in his tribe, newborns learned naturally to communicate through silence with the world around them. Gestures and expressions of spirit conveyed warnings, exhortations, and concerns from the Bia gods Biliku, as well as shared feelings from the heart. Speech, in contrast, was transactional, used for trade, planning, or resolution of problems. It was needed most when a member of the tribe needed to leave, or when the communal bond was threatened by conflict, when dealing with outsiders, for example. What all the non-natives had in common was dependence on verbal thought. Without words, neither reason nor understanding could occur. So among the Leo people, so not, not so among Leo's people. And Leo is the character who is an indigenous Bia person who comes to live in the city and helps Claire with her mission to learn these languages. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So I'll end with this slide, but before that, this whole idea of anthropology coming together with the idea of silence. The language that Claire learns to based on her anthropological interest later develops into what she uses as code to talk to survivors on the island after it has been taken over by the Japanese and to locate her child over there. She develops the Bia language into a code that can be transmitted from the mainland to the islands. And that is the war aspect of it. That is how the language then gets appropriated into this whole discourse of colonialism. And the idea of silence is completely vanishes in the whole you know, discourse of violence that the war brings into the conversation. And the central part of the language when it emerged in, uh, as it began in the novel was the fact that it was about communicating with nature and communicating and understanding the island being embedded in the island's ecology, so as to say. So this last part of the sort of conversation kind of gives you an idea of what the Bia people actually use the language for rather than the code that actually develops from the Bia language that Claire develops to kind of defeat uh, Japanese uh, forces in a way. It helps the British forces to kind of pass information, um, blockade, etc. So it is kind of a, you know, a tool in the uh, novel to kind of change the fortunes of Claire as well as the British in this region. So this part is where uh, Leo tells Claire that he can feel the spirit dance, as you did, Claire said, through several discussions about this. Leo had never been able to articulate how it sends this dancing before the quake even began. So it's before the earthquake that Leo had told Claire and her family that there was going to be an earthquake and they should be coming out of the house, much like how we have read later in anthropological writings that the indigenous people knew that the tsunami was going to strike and they had moved to higher ground. So Leo smiled, lifting one palm high above Kuli's phantom head and lowering the other onto his knees. Kuli can hear Billy Billy could dance more than one hour before the ground will shake. Six cents, Claire wrote in her field book, magnetic fields, natural attunement, magic, some deep vibration. And this very, you know, interaction between the scientific, a sort of a struggle to name this intuition scientifically is there in this novel, as well as in the Girija Prasad and Chanda Devi dynamic as well, where Chanda Devi intuits the um, ecology of the island, whereas uh, Girija Prasad tries to ascertain it scientifically. And what the novel does is to bring these two aspects, the scientific and the, you know, the more intuitive way of living in the island together in the structure of the geology of the area itself, the fault line that runs through uh, Himalayas and this, you know, mid-oceanic ridge 
So both silence, the idea of deep time versus human time and how ecology and environmental um, you know, concerns figure into it comes to forefront in this kind of understanding of how silence works in relation to language and that bringing together the concept of deep time with human time. So that's what I tried to do in today's talk. I don't know if it was <laughs> understandable or, you know, so thank you for that. That's great. I Luca, agree. are you coming in yeah. or am I going? Yes, in? I think I was, but I don't see my video anyways. Uh, no, but we can see you now. You can see me. OK, good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, Ananya, <Yes. laughs> would you like to share some some of your reflections? Um, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Arunima. I really loved that. My God, this is to be honest, I'll let everybody into a public secret. The only reason I organize anything is because I don't have any time to, to study anything myself. So it's great to just hear others teaching you, you know, things you need to know. So these seminars are really extremely, um, you know, eye-opening and the resources that we are getting. Um, and I'm hoping that the, our audience members and whoever else will access um, the 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 recordings afterwards will also benefit from. I mean, these are really valuable because I do sense that, you know, this is a very interesting moment. Uh, you, of course, Arunima have, I know you've also worked on like historical or other like older um, uh, writings on the Andamans, you know, so one could very easily have just given a talk on, you know, anthropologists talking about the Andamans and you mention the timeline. So obviously when there are colonial efforts to settle a place, there will be records and archives, you know, which can also be read. And I know you've done all that, but instead you chose to kind of uh, showcase the fact that for reasons that are quite fascinating, there seems to be a critical mass of, of emergent fiction, you know, um, novels uh, based or, or interested in the space and, um, you you pointed out in the beginning some of the common and they all seem there seem to be a large number of women <laughs> interested in 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 these uh, in the space uh, the protagonists are also therefore uh, often female um this predicates a certain kind of you know emphasis um and so on and uh, they are very often um <laughs> you had to change your own title you said it, it's interesting that islands are part of India, you know, in terms of geopolitical and national kind of like identity, uh, but the the authors who seem to be drawn to it are pretty much drawn from everywhere. You know, we had, of course, we have Uzma, Aslam Khan's Nomi Ali. We've talked about that uh, already last semester, um, and then you know we happen to have Shubangi Swaroop, but we also have Amy Liu. So you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of um, projection, it seems to me, of, of, of certain kinds of identity conundrums seem to be like one way of dealing with them for our authors uh, seem to be uh, to, to locate narratives in the space and see where it takes them. So I really enjoyed uh, that reminder. And of course, we therefore also get to hear about two other novels, which seem really compelling. I am actually, I'm going to again, uh, you know, risk my, <laughs> my reputation and say I have not yet read The Latitudes of Longing, but of course, it's on my list of, of must reads and now even more so. And the Amy Liu novel was also very interesting in the way you brought out the commonality between these two. And I was thinking of other commonalities with um, Uzma Aslam Khan's novel, which Shazia pointed out last time, for example, in the whole idea of, of nature and language and how language uh, assumes another kind of way of communication in kind of dialogue with, with, with nature, with the wind, with the waves. We had all that with, in Shazia's reading. So um, the children, you know, in both novels, there are children and there are friendships across communities which are pushed by the children. Um, they seem to have a certain natural, again, this is of course a very common literary trope, but used well, um, children's innocence or ability to cross boundaries and borders mm -hmm. and just kind of their ability mm -hmm. therefore to understand another epistemology and, and explore islands in their, on, that, on the terms 
on those terms. They don't have any fear or they don't have any anything holding them back. So children are used to good, um, you know, they're very well effectively mobilized by both novelists. Um, and uh, uh, so I was, I was really, I, I was really grateful to you for giving us such a neat and such a helpful guide through uh, this emergent corpus. Um, and then I don't know how neat it. it was. Like I, have... I think it was quite neat. It was pretty neat. <laughs> <laughs> what can you it do? I mean, know like that I'm to... give... <laughs> yeah, but we give people thirty minutes, and you know, of course, you know, that's never actually enough in that sense. But I, I assure you, it was enough for all of us wetting our appetite and getting to see some of these structures and some, some interesting kind of lines of, uh, um, of discussion. So I'll just kind of end with uh, my comments with a couple of uh, queries or openings. And I'd love to hear others also uh, from the audience. Uh, you know, we have a, a tight little group of people I recognize who are all interested in these issues. So we'd want to hear from them. Firstly, I think it's quite interesting that so many of us are going back to Epeli Haufa. We can't seem to open. <laughs> <laughs> anything archipelagic and Indian anymore, or, you know, Indian Ocean without talking about Epeli Haufa. So I'm, I'm very um, fascinated by the, by, by the kind of, you know, by the uh, congenial kind of, you know, relation, or, or rather the way in which Epeli Haufa's essay is, is turned to by us, because we really see him saying something very strong in there, even though the geology of the Pacific doesn't quite sit you know, on the geology of the Indian Ocean, as we think it, I think his central idea of um, destabilizing the idea that you can only be geopolitically or epistemologically, or even, I mean, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, you can only be important if you're a large landmass, you know, that is really, I think, the biggest lesson we take away that absolutely not, we have, we, he gives us a tool to reorient our expectations our alignment of importance uh, with, with size in a way and uh, connectedness to landmass. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very useful um, and poetic and passionate, you know, like uh, sort of essay. If I just can come in over here, yeah, just with course. an observation, is that, you know, like when I was, of course I read Epili Hoffa in a cultural context, but then when I was looking at the fault line, because the fault yeah. line is so, it figures so hugely in this novel, there are fault lines across the Pacific as well. The Hawaiian Islands actually are based on a fault line as well. So it's so interesting to see that these issues are, you know, occurring along fault lines in both yes. the regions. And they are all based with like natural resources, exploitation around natural resources. You know, so it's it's just the nutmeg curse, for example, you know, volcanoes. And this is yes. so it's all related, you know, in that geological sense, the fault lines give you a sort of opening into the richest parts of Earth's resources. And that brings in all these economic complications that then lead to all the other factors that the novels bring out. And we study and Epeli Hapa as well talks about. I think that's uh, the, the, your emphasis on fault line there, again, as a, as a connector, you know, across uh, these oceans, because it's a geological feature that recurs in, in, in oceanic spaces um, with certain uh, cultural and historical implications. Um, and I find that really compelling because even in the work that I'm doing with Ari Gauthier, we too have gone to a fault line now. I mean, this is really fascinating. As you know, we were there in our latest, uh, you know, live, we talked about the Palakkad gap, you know, this idea that um, he has written a short story uh, in December, yeah. uh, which explores his own uh, identity as somebody uh, with, a, with one parent who's from Madagascar and one parent who's, who's Tamil from India mm -hmm. and what that means for him but he has no cultural in a way relationship with Madagascar uh, he just knows he's kind of biologically linked to Madagascar but what does that mean and he uses the idea of the Palakkad gap which is a geological mm -hmm. structure which shows which marks um, exactly the place it seems um, in, the Indi uh, in the Indian subcontinent where Madagascar broke away you know and floated mm -hmm. off to become an island mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, and, and it and of course, there's a lot of geological research done on the Palakkad Gap, which he read, and it reminded me of Girija Prasad talking about the paper on the Andamans being part of the Himalaya. So there is the yeah. yeah. So, um, so in, in, in short, um, different, again, we are not just thinking of islands and archipelagos, we are kind of also extending our interest to thinking of larger geo geological uh, features, um, which um, do a couple of things. Um, 
I think joined the archipelagic in actually giving um, us, uh, giving, giving writers and readers a whole new set of tropes or also narrative devices to structure narrative through. And you did that very well, I think, in showing us how that works on a literary critical level. And the second thing it seems to do is also, um, so you've got, you've, 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 you've got these um, geological structures, you know, kind of giving us narrative structures, if you like, you know. And the second thing is it allows us, I think, also to apprehend different temporalities, as you also pointed mm. out. So, um, you know, uh, slow time, different scales of time, and then national time then becomes, in a way, subordinated, you know. Uh, Homi Baba is the one who most famously, perhaps infamously by now, because we're so bored of him, frankly speaking, I'm again going public <laughs> on this. But, you know, he did usefully set out these issues of the performative time, the pedagogy. So, you know, there is a kind of national time. And, uh, yeah. and very see, definitely in case of Andamans. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you know, where your timeline was showing how that in a, in a national timeline where the Andamans would fit in, mm -hmm. how they moved from the possibility mm. of being part of another national configuration decisively into, into ours. But there's another timeline. There are many other timelines. And I think attaching, using the geological sort of like, you know, like templates help us kind of revives in us that awareness that there's deep time, slow time and so on. Um, so I, I was really uh, re uh, excited to see how we, we can really um, conduct some archipelagic readings actually. Uh, a lot of the archipelagic theory that we read is theoretical. Some of it comes from geography. Some of it comes from, you know, people writing about their place on islands. And here we are actually seeing how it could be mobilized into mm. literary, uh, a literary kind of critical um, apparatus, which I think is 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 really uh, very helpful um, in in moving forward. You know, in, we all want to know what do we do with archipelagic, you know, so this yes. your reading helps us understand that's that's a set of things we can do. Um, and what you do, therefore, I think, through your taking us through these two novels is to show us that the place of the Andamans in the national imagination, which you started with, which is basically I I did a little diagram, three P's, the peripheral, the penal and partition, you know? So these three um, these three aspects of the Andamans are really left behind when we yeah. embark on these journeys with the authors, uh, Amy Liu being American uh, with a Chinese parent um, and born, I think, or having spent a few early years in India. In Delhi. In yeah. Delhi. And now she is, uh, you know, writing from America, but she wants to connect uh, to some part of her life and she uses the Andamans to connect. It's really interesting. Uh, uh, just, uh, you know, like uh, now uh, you have to tell us maybe a little bit more about Shubhangi Swarup. I don't know her bio. I'm assuming she's Indian. Um, yes. But from I Mumbai. Think yeah. So it's very interesting that she does her own decentering in this uh, four part structure of, of the mm. novel where mm. she's talking about, uh, you know, uh, the, the um, islands, uh, the fault line, valley, and snow desert. So you can see that again. But it's not, of, none of the areas are centrally Indian as we understand exactly. in Indian English. That's what I mean. She's, so she's doing that decentering, you know, she's going from periphery to periphery, whether it's land periphery or water periphery or whatever, you know. So um, I just think that these are very interesting maneuvers. Thank you for bringing them to our notice. Um, and I think um, I'm going to see if we have questions, which I hope, and we've, we've had a little conversation as I've gone along, you've responded, which is very nice, but of course, uh, our it's just uh, one little thing I would like to add about creolization, you know, because there's so yes. much of creolization is about language, yes. and uh, you know, but this both these novels actually cannot do without talking about silence as the central tenet of the languages of the island. Like if you, in the previous talk as well, you know, uh, the whole idea of the tri indigenous language is centered on silence and a silence communion with your fellow human beings, as well as that of the island, you know, the language of the winds, if I'm correct in you know, remembering. <laughs> so, and in these two novels as well, it, the silence is foregrounded. So you don't need languages in order to kind of, you know, understand. So it's talking about, uh, you know, about an empathy that needs to be there 
which is not based on these divides and language also brings in national uh, connotations and of belonging and of a particular politics that one is situated in. So if it's silence, then it's more human on that level. It's more like um, in, in conversation with your environment, but not relegated to certain cultural backgrounds tied to them. So I found that very interesting when I was thinking about the idea of creolization and how to approach it through the insistence of silence in these novels. That's actually marvelous as well. Thank you for bringing, I mean, that was one issue that of course, you know, <laughs> I, I would have loved to talk about and I kind of forgot in my, I'm not forgot, but you know, I kind of missed out picking up on, uh, but, but certainly um, there are some puzzles, I think that these novels also, you know, kind of pose um, and they are to do with notions of, of what happens to uh, island societies. And we know that the idea and history of creolization um, is something that happens, you know. So mm -hmm. I was very interested. I think our, um, when I read Nomi Ali, uh, mm -hmm. the way she was describing the island bonds, you know, that mm -hmm. category corresponds perfectly to this idea that Creoles are those who are born in the new space. Mm -hmm. yeah. Once you have a new generation, that's the cultural Creole. And um, yes. They are speaking a Creole, you know, usually. So the two language and identity go together, uh, but they often don't. And I'm really interested, again, in the case of the Andaman Islands, maybe this is an example uh, where you, you get a definition of an island born, therefore Creole in a, in a, in a kind of technical yeah. sense. Community. But what are they speaking? Is it also a Creole or maybe not? Or maybe there are many different possibilities linguistically. Yeah. Maybe we have to think of different correspondences. Um, and the idea of silence as an adjunct, not even an adjunct, as a, as a kind of like superior uh, possibility within language um, is, is therefore um, either leaving the notion of Creolization and its complexities and problems behind or asking us if we cannot creolize even silence and speech and come yeah. to some other amalgam, you know? So these are puzzles that the, I think these are the puzzles and paradoxes I think the novels pose. It, uh, it is certainly E.T. Abraham's uh, essay that tantalizingly draws us to the possibilities or even the word having been used in a certain kind of discourse, yes, official discourse. And then I did track down the peoples of India uh, publications and indeed they are using those words in the ways that uh, it abraham indicates so it is quite interesting that there is a track record or a, there is a paper trail of certain anthropologists commissioned to create this peoples of india you know handbooks mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. of india, for andaman and Ikebar, yes, same. Uh, yes, Singh was the person yes, who was, yes, you know, yeah. yes thank you uh he obviously was quite uh you know like open to the idea of using this vocabulary to analyze the, the social reformulations of the Andamans. Yes. Uh, but E.T. Abraham is also, uh, you know, um, pointing in his, in, his, in his argument how that possibility almost closes up. Mm. And there is an anxiety after a while that this is actually perhaps not such a good thing to propose <laughs> as a way of thinking of what's going on in, in the Andamans. Yes. So, I mean, there are many different ways in which we can, of course, bring creolization into dialogue with the archipelagic as we like to do. Um, but as always, it's not an easy or like obvious or even a banal equation. Rather, there are dialogues and possibilities and puzzles. So we are, I think, playing again with these issues, yeah. um, circling around them and seeing wh where, where they take us. Um, I don't know whether there's I saw one comment. Um, oh, there is a comment, uh, a question from Farah Noor. So maybe it's a good moment for you and me um, to pause our uh, our dialogue and conversation and maybe mm -hmm. the others. So Luca, do you want to read out for us? Yes, yes. So, uh, well, thanks Farah for the, the, the question. <clears throat> and Farah is uh, thanking you for the enriching presentation. And she's wondering, as she was listening to you, um, about the relations of time and space that you were talking about with reference to the islands themselves and to the literary explorations. Um, so while listening to this, um, Farah was wondering if and how the concept of chronotope uh, could be significant or not for these narratives of your readings here. Because mm. I've actually not thought about it. Of course, I will. I will now that you have suggested it. 
But uh, when I was thinking of time and space, I was trying to think of how the novel brings time and space to the surface for the reader. And that is where I came up to water. And on the few publications that I found on Swadru, uh, there have been sections on water because it's just you, something you cannot miss if you're reading the novel. So I was thinking of how more than chronotope, I was thinking of how it is made visible, how time and space is made visible in the novel. And it is usually through water, through the element of water in various forms. So I tried to track that as a different way of approaching how space and time together are brought together in the novel. And when we're talking of space and time, the novel is pushing back into the past, you know, of colonial past, and then coming to the very recent future, talking about the tsunami. So there's generations connected, though it's very distinct four parts, but there are uh, the characters are related to each other tangentially. So there's this intergenerational sort of trauma as well, you know, as I mentioned, with the earthquake and the tsunami, linking the father and the, you know, daughter, and then the, then there's the grandson as well. So it's, it's like a lot of characters that are linked with you know, the, the ghost of Grija Prasad visiting this person suspended inside the glacier. So it's the ocean versus the glacier. It's a, it's a mind blowing novel. You have to read it. So it's just that, you know, just the presence of that element in both these contexts that was more interesting other than framing it through chronotope. And I was consciously trying to keep away from um, a theory that would, you know, theory like this, like chronotope, that would easily help me understand this because I would want to do it through a different way and not resort to the older ways of understanding time and space that we already have got because the novels are really trying to push us to a different understanding of how we can think of these two together, time and space, and particularly going deep down instead of going across mm -hmm. synchronously. So that way, both in time and in space, geologically and deep time. So that's what I tried to think about while writing this. In Great. a way, I was thinking, and this is I'm also addressing Farah, um, I'm wondering whether chronotope, I mean, it's a very, it's a very useful, it's a classic kind of a trope. Uh, you know, we use it, uh, narrative theory, you know, it's useful. Um, but sometimes maybe we need to play around with what we think is useful because they need to be, their utility needs to be extended or, or manipulated a little bit to fit new desires or needs on the part of our, for example, here um, in, 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 in these novels. I mean, if you have water, water is not very solid. So, I mean, you know, of course, when it becomes a glacial kind of mass, it does, but in other, you know, the whole idea I think is that it's, it seems to me that there's an instability of form that it can yes. be solid at one point, but then it becomes vapor. I mean, so that doesn't quite, uh, in my mind, sit with the idea of a topos, you know, yes. because the idea of a topos is, is like space, which we understand is, as you said, of like flat and, and it's also kind of denotes a kind of synchronous nature of time unfolding in a novel. So it's very, it's kind of sits with a certain kind of realist, you know, novelistic kind of expectations. Um, but the space of topos, the topos of topos, I think is certainly, I don't think we're expecting it to vaporize one minute and, you know, like a flow. But it is, the novel does try to make the point that it is a, you know, like the fluidity of the earth's surface itself. It's not stable. So yeah. there's an earthquake and the whole island is ripped into two and then the tilts from its axis and certain areas get submerged. It's kind of like, you know, how Amitav Chaudhary would write about the Sundarbans. Like, how do you define topos as the space at that time? It's already you're taking into account a character that you would associate with water when you are describing yeah. the space. Yeah. So that is what here, like there's this whole imagery about, you know, this little myth that she says that the, there's a fish at the center of the earth, which moves its tail. And every time it moves its tail, there's this huge shift, uh, earthquakes. And so fish again, something related to water, which lives in the water. And then, so it's, it's, it is trying to, you know, bring the solidity that we imagine yeah about territory, sovereignty, yes. all these ideas are linked to the yeah. solidity of the landmass. And that if we make that fluid or imagine how it is linked to the, you know, glaciers are cutting through the land in order to form the land, but it's basically water it's shaping the land. It, the valleys that we live in have been made by glaciers which have landed into the sea now and is water. So just mm. that idea, if you keep that in mind, 
while thinking of space, octopus, as you said, is something that will change the way we would think of it as fixed and flow kind of thing. We really Opposition. need a new word. We need a new word. Everybody get hard, to, hard at work um, <laughs> to somehow supplement uh, chronotope. I was, I was reminded of two things, and I'm just going to mention them very quickly because I see there's another very interesting question. Yes, yes. Um, asked I, I was thinking of the question of this. Um, I just was reminded of the um, phrase in Kutsia's uh, Waiting for Barbarians, where he laments and wants to live like a fish in water and uh, mm. something in air or something. You know, this idea that there are other ways of living in the elements, uh, which are imperial, um, you know, time. And that novel also says we can never get out the time of history. Empire has created the time of history. So I suddenly remember that entire discussion in that novel um, could be something to go back to. It's also about Kronos and Topos and instability in mm. its own ways. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was reminded of a completely randomly, a beautiful um, Spanish um, um, documentary, poetic, lyrical film, which I cannot remember the name of the author of, but I can easily find it, which is called Agua Espejo uh, oh. so the, uh, of Granada. So Agua Espejo, like mirror of uh, water, water mirror water. of Granada. I'm going to send that to everybody. And we, of course, once yes. I send it, I remember who made the film. But it is absolutely amazing. It's all about the shifting quality of water. And it's all about Granada. And again, memory and space and all the rest. OK, I will stop there now because Sritama has a question. So, Luca, over yes. to Thank you uh, for the there is a question. I remember. There yeah. is, sorry, there is a question. And there is also the a proposed new word, aquatrope, by Farah. <laughs> So she's already, you know, <laughs> trying to explore new directions for the chronotope. Lovely. Uh, <laughs> That's aquatrope. Like. Or aquatope. Well, aquatrope. But anyways, um, <laughs> it's chrono. <laughs> but anyway, sorry, I don't want to get lost in that. Let's move to Sri um question. Um, so um, she was very interested in the concept of creolization in relation to the local borns in the Andamans that um, you, Aruna and Ananya were talking about in the in the discussion right after the presentation. Um, and uh, so picking up on this, she she would like to know uh, what the potential limits of thinking with creolization in the Andamans uh, are or could be. Mm. That's a brilliant a big question. question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm also in the process of thinking, you know, how to use creolization as I am deriving from all these people I'm reading through to these, uh, you know, this particular, these three novels that I'm working with. So language and silence, as I mentioned, is one of them because I was thinking of language as a central thing that comes up in discussions of creolization. And then what do I do with the insistence on silence in all these novels in relation to that? So what does that say about, like there are sections, you know, of um, history as in like people who have written on it, like all these people, I mean, I've tagged them in my essay, but I have not mentioned, I think quotations from them, but uh, of course, all the people who have written about the Andaman Islands over time, have mentioned how languages have changed in that island. So Urdu was one of the languages that was spoken a lot, but with the Indianization in that sense, a lot of movement of people to the Andaman Islands, particularly during partition and later. So now the oral sort of, you know, scope, scape of the island, you hear more Bengali and more Tamil. And then, and uh, Iti Abra mentions this as well, where uh, Bengali people take care of like administration, building, all of that. And uh, Tamil people are more into business and, and you hear those languages more. So there's a, there's a change in the way, of course, there's a Creole language as well. And it's mentioned in the novels as well. But later influxes into the island have changed the way Creole languages developed in the initial phase of it, uh, with the first three communities that the descendants of the uh, cellular jail and people from some of the indigenous tribes who were cultured into the thing. And of course, then the partition and the movement of people there. So it's a constantly changing thing. So language and silence was one of the limits of realization that I was thinking about. Of course, when I talk about like, when we are thinking of creolizations, we are also thinking like if, you know, going by all the conversations I've heard from Ari and Ananya on their Tinnai, uh, to think about it in a more granular way, you know, that's that's what the approach is more like. So think about it in more specific terms about what creolization and what, what are the communities, what are they doing in order to. So you have 
that brings me to the concepts of like what is Andaman being represented as, packaged as in a way, like, you know, in terms of their heritage, in terms of the buildings that you see if you are a tourist there, the kind of thing. So it, that kind of clashes with what creolization as politics and creolization as practice as you live it everyday life versus the version that one would want to see or the administration would want to see or whatever. So those two things vary and there are a lot of, you know, complex politics happening between what is the lived reality, what is the projection of it, and the novels also to an extent deal with that, that what, uh, like, uh, um, Amy Liu's novel ends with, you know, the son, Tai, going back to the Andaman Islands much later, like from 1940s, they went away, and then he goes back when he's much older, and he goes and meets uh, Naila, who was his ayah, quote unquote, at that time. So there's this whole coming back and the whole memory of these people who had lived at that time that he had picked up the languages and everything, which he traveled back with to US and then came back again. And that's also part of his memory. So it's about looking at communities in that sense as well, communities who are not on the Andamans at this moment, but had been part of it over the years. So think about realization as this thing, a transnational concept as well, in a way. So those are the, some of the things I can think of from the top of my head. Yeah. Well, having read neither novel, I dare not <laughs> venture some sort of... Uh, You're doing so good having to read neither novel. Some sort of, you know, like some sort of like uh, response to, uh, to uh, Sritama in the sense that vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, because you have asked about the limits and possibilities of creolization vis-a-vis -vis these novels. Um, and I won't, uh, I won't start expounding on what they might be without having read the novels, but it appears to me that there is definitely an interest in um, thinking about um, the limits and possibilities of creating new communities, you know, on these islands um, and their relationship to prior anterior histories and parallel uh, realities unfolding elsewhere. And, Creolization as a theoretical concept also can be used to gauge uh, or, or, or articulate theoretically, analyze uh, those 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 you know uh, those imaginary those the workings of the imagination of the novelists as they try to imagine what could this new community community be what could its limits and possibilities be when were they foreclosed when did they you know how can they thrive again or so on and so forth so I think yeah. that. Theoretically, and then talking about realization, I'm also very aware of my own positionality. You know, the fact that none of these writers are from the island, and also the fact that I'm not from the island, I've never been there yet. And we really cannot expect, like, we there is no novel written by a Beatrice person or a Ongi's person about Andaman. So, what do you do about that? Like, if you are to address creolization, what do you do about the fact that all the representations of it are in language in English that I'm dealing with right now? Of course, there are there in regional languages, but mostly by people who are not part of that island. So, that's also something that is a limit, I would say. I mean, this is a very interesting point. I, I agree because uh, in other Play, for example, where you've got uh, like the Caribbean, you know, you, you can have people uh, external to the Caribbean depicting the Caribbean, but there's so many depictions coming from in, within the Caribbean. I mean, of different parts of that, you know, we don't have any like we're spoiled for choice almost. So you, 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 you can. Hear, but what happens when a space at, the, at this moment is being consistently represented in whichever way? sympathetic, oh. empathetic, whatever, but the representations are consistently by people who have no mm -hmm. lived biological or even cultural locational connection with those spaces. Are you just projecting something, you know? Uh, and and what is the what are the politics of that act of exactly. projection? Um, however, here I think the work of Manuela Boatka could be quite helpful, and I'm putting her name down in the chat. She would love uh, to see that she's being cited by these uh, literary oh, yes, yes. Mm. But Manuela is working on sociology and she is talking about creolization of theory. I mean, how the idea of creolization can even actually operate at a theoretical level to make us mm. think about, for example, relationality, different kinds of positions. So for example, her work is about how Transylvania, how Europe, how different European locations can be reconfigured by say the fact that there are European outposts in the Caribbean. So what does that make Europe, you know? So I think there is a, there is a way to um, think, to lever oneself above just the 
very kind of empirical, you know, empirical uh, data. Who is writing these novels? Where are, what are they writing about? How are they located? Have they been to the Andamans or not? We know all that and we are equipped. We know about representation and we know about the politics of representation. Mm. We're careful. We don't want to like make any like, uh, you know, any kind of like- Assumptions. Uh, yeah, assumptions or any kind of like naive statements. But given all that, we can still perhaps think, okay, what's happening nevertheless? Surely these authors are also aware of their position. They still yeah. choose to talk about Pandamans. What are they doing? How are they putting some uh, breaks, you know, into mm. any untrammeled representation of the other? What are their anxieties? Uditi has a great question. Um, no, I, I didn't know that the Bengali speaking people spoke Creole. That's so interesting. Wow, uh, we all have to go to the Andamans and hear ourselves, right? What's going on? Thank you, Diti. Um, this is amazing. Uh, it is there in the language. The Bengalis refugees settled mm. in, speak a, a Creole kind of, and in the Tamil. So it's really waiting, isn't it, for some linguist to go, Uditi, you want to say something? Why not? Let's bring Uditi in. Yeah, I just, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Yeah, so I just kind of, you know, wanted to uh, give you an example of what I mean that the Bengali yes. speak a Creole language. Yes. So some some of the seniors often have held on to whichever dialect they spoke back in the districts of East Pakistan, right? Yeah, yeah. Because that dialect was, because they were put up, put up in isolated communities. So mm -hmm. in different households and different villages, you would find families speaking, um, like the older generation would hold on to the dialect, but mixed in with that would be some standard Bengali. Okay. Some mm. Hindi coming in from the administrators. And mm -hmm. interestingly, all the words used to describe the forest or the landscape were yeah. drawn from the language spoken by the Orao or Munda tribes who wow. were brought in as forest workers, right? So yes. a hilltop in the Andaman Islands is called a Tikri by everybody. Mm -hmm whether you're Tamil, Bengali, or, you know, Bhojpuri, because the forest workers called it a tikri, right? Okay. Uh, a tree stump is a bonga, mm -hmm. also in Bengali, a tree stump is a bonga, right? So I, so I, while doing these interviews, I also realized uh, that, you know, there's also, you know, as, you know, as kind of, you know, communities have kind of moved in as you know you realize that you know the the divisions which you know uh, you've spoken of actually is quite right that the bengalis mostly are or iti speaks of bengalis mostly take care of the buildings and stuff the tamils are more in kind of businesses but in the everyday life these people are encounter each other and very mm, interesting one of my respondents told me that i speak three languages but i don't speak a single one properly right <laughs> so <laughs> there is there, there is a lived sense of, you know, creolization, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I mean, creolization is something which actually allows us to play with power, right? Uh, and get away from, you know, very kind of, you know, rigid hierarchies, you know, whether it's, you know, ruler of the rule or occupied, occupied, you know. Uh, but I mean, this creolization, um, runs into some trouble when you start looking at, okay, what are the changes in the indigenous communities? Mm -hmm. right? um, this is where, you know, because, and here again, the story is the indigenous communities, the Jarawa have picked up Hindi. They mm -hmm. know the names of the settlers. The opposite is not true, mm. right? So it's not like any Jarawa words have made their way mm. into the languages spoken, even in the buffer zone or even among the poachers, right? So there we are looking at a very uh, one-way traffic. So, so mm. in, in that way, the Andaman Islands is, it has been managed by the Indian government as a, as a kind of split geographical terrain, mm. right? Because of the level of quote-unquote protection given to the primitive mm. tribes, in quote-unquote primitive tribes. So, so these are just some thoughts, but I just wanted to kind of, you know, throw in some of the examples which I had encountered of creolization to say that these may not actually make their way into the novels, but I think the island space in its research or even in kind of future writing of those novels where you know the authors can visit and are allowed to visit. I mean, Uzma hasn't been to the island for no fault of her own. I mean, she wanted yeah. to. She yeah. requested me to somehow arrange it, you know, and uh, and I was like, Uzma, my reach doesn't go that far. <laughs> <I can't. laughs> 
<laughs> arranged for a Pakistani to visit the Andaman Islands. So, so it is it is monitored by the state in a way that actually also hampers the possibility of this. But in that way, you know, these spaces, these conversations can also be a way of you know sharing thoughts and ideas, which is why I decided to kind of speak up and kind of uh, talk about. Thank you. As an I want to thank you for your book as well. It has been of immense help. <laughs> I, um, I, I actually thought those examples from Uditi were amazing and again shows both the limits and the possibilities of creolization to go back to Sritama's uh, formulation, because on the one hand we see the limit because the Jarwa, for example, is the limit you could say in, in, in very very kind of empirical terms again in this case, but there are possibilities of another kind. Um, and also there are possibilities of rethinking the assumptions of creolization itself. Because if we go back say to the Caribbean, there's always the haunting of the Caribbean um, imaginary by the indigenous, um, the mm -hmm. disappeared, mostly disappeared indigenous. So even uh, uh, Sandrine has a question and we'll, we'll hopefully end with that, but Sandrine has worked on, um, on, on, um, on um, Mutusami and all these Guadalupian, Indo-Guadalupian writers. And, and they are also calling Guadalupe Caruquera, which is the indigenous name for Guadalupe. So, you know, there are, but it, there are always, Derek Walcott is talking about the iguana, he's talking about the Arawak, you know, they're always this kind of longing for mm. that layer. But the, what happens when that layer is kind of like there, still segregated, and in a re repetition of the penal and carceral almost mm. for protection. Mm. Actually, we can add a fourth P. We can add peripheral, penal, partitioned, and protected. Protected. <laughs> That's it. So that you know. is that is such a big, you know, like all the anthropological documents I read up. That's so much. There's so much discussion about what's happening internationally with indigenous tribes and what should happen with India and its response to you know people who want to do research on Andamans. It's just there's a lot of literature on that. <laughs> I like the peripatetic. That's great. <laughs> yes. We love it. I'm very tempted to make a fifth category, the Pakistani, who cannot go. But I think that would be that would be making light of a very grim situation. Shall we end with Sandrine's question? Luca, do you want yes. to read it yes. out? And yes, it is. It is a question that returns uh, to. I mean, the stay is actually on uh, on the question of languages on the issue of languages. Um, first, there is a sort of a you know, she, she's saying that um, something that, that makes her thinking is how Bengali that is spoken by almost 30% of the population on the island hasn't been acknowledged as an official language while in the is, is uh, even though this one is only spoken by 30% of the population according to the census. Um, and then, you know, the question is if, uh, Arunima, you are interested in the many languages spoken there and their interactions, uh, intermingling, reciprocal transformations, of course, including also English, which happens also to be the, the language that you are uh, using in terms of also the fictional works that you are analyzing. Okay. But first, uh, about the previous conversation, thank you, Sritama, for that question. I got to know so much because you asked that question. Um, and coming to Sandrine's question, Yes, first of all, like I have actually been in touch with these bureaucrats only because I, because I couldn't go because of the pandemic to the Andaman. So the people I have been conversing with are the people who are, you know, who know about the Andaman survey uh, office and who are located in Calcutta. And most of my reading so far has been about general publications on Andamans. And it, of course, there's a lot of publications on languages uh, in anthropological journals of uh, languages of the Andaman Islands. That's how I have, you know, got some material on it, but it's not, um, it's not like field work, you know, as because I've not been, be, I've not been able to visit there yet. So, though the project has been on for some time now. But yes, that of course, definitely I would be interested because a lot of the, oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, I will, I will. Um, I, I have only 
you know, got to Man in India and, you know, all the major journals of anthropology in India and the early publications on Andaman Islands. And particularly, the most of them are actually about the languages and the terms and how they have evolved and everything. So that's the kind of access I have. Of course, I will be interested in doing fieldwork on the language because as, you know, has come up with this discussion, it's a major part of how to understand how creolization works because that if I am to talk about the relationship of Andamans with India as a you know mainland territory, then of course it has to be you know creolization and what it means in terms of language has to be taken into account. So definitely yes, I will. And do we have an answer? The very again the question about why Bengali spoken by thirty percent of the population hasn't been acknowledged as an official language? Is it just because the assumption is that in these display spaces Hindi must somehow? be renamed because it's the national language in a way probably that i mean maybe the bureaucrats who are posi posited there, i mean positioned there they speak hindi because most of the central government staff do speak yeah. hindi right that's how you yeah. see in calcutta offices as well people speak hindi so it's very interesting isn't it because if it's a space where it's kind of creole uh it's understood to be this kind of template of creolization and also the original inhabitants cannot give their language to the federate federated table because they are put in a you know protected place and they are not meant to be interacting with any of us uh, so they don't count quote unquote so then the choice is open you as Sandrine mm. says why not choose Bengali or whatever or mm. Tamil but somehow we must go back to Hindi which shows again this territorializing heartland impulse which I call you know of of um, Indianness uh, that yeah. uh, got a blank slot we the instinct is to fill it with Hindi uh, mm. because isn't that the most obvious thing to do to cement the nation together uh, and maybe that's pretty much uh, the reasoning also there. it might be a class issue as you know yeah. Professor Sen has mentioned like it's it's like Bengalis the population is a rural underclass so it might be a class issue as well right that yeah yeah as, and as, as Uditi mentioned, the Bengali that they are speaking is probably descended from several uh, so-called, uh, you know, like dialects, which are not high Bengali. Uditi, you want to come in there? Um, maybe you can help us here. I, I mean, I, I did encounter some awareness among some of the Bengali people around the fact that their children are not taught in Bengali. So actually, you have a oh. situation within families where mm -hmm. uh, one generation is more fluent, the younger generation is more comfortable in Hindi, yeah. while the older generation barely speaks Hindi. And mm -hmm. this is, you know, the impact. This, this has actually had a massive impact. But this again opens up the conversation around, you know, so then what is happening to language within these homes, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, because of these situations. But there is some awareness of, you know, how, you know, the not including Bengali, um, as an official language, basically means there is no compulsion to provide, you know, um, primary education in Bengali, right? And the fascinating so I, thing is, I am, I'm really curious to know what kind of Hindi accent is coming out of all this, because, you know, what, what are they sounding sorts, like? All sorts. There's Tamil mixed in, there's Hindi mixed in, there's Bengali mixed in. It really depends on which region you're going to and, you know, what they are coming up with. So, um, so it is it is truly a language, you know, hodgepodge and Hindi is the lingua franca. Mm, but mm. the other interesting thing is like even like most even most rural people in the Andaman Islands, even the most kind of not, you know, educated, but again, literacy is very high in the Andaman Islands, even in the rural regions. Uh, people speak two to three languages as routine or a mm -hmm. smattering of a third language at least because they've picked it up because if the mm -hmm. trade is Tamil, they've picked it up. Right. So, um, so it's, it's, it's interesting. But I don't have an answer to Sandrine's question, really, other than what you proposed, Ananya. But what might be more interesting is to think of the consequences of that decision yeah. and what yeah. this does to the, you know, language spoken in the island. Well, it appears that in a, a, a Hindi has become kind of a lingua franca, as you said, Uditi. The word was on my mind when you pronounced it, so I was certainly following your line of thought. And um, I've been doing some research, as Luca knows, on the history of thinking about lingua franca as lingua franca uh, in the 19th century. And in the hands of those early Creole linguistics pioneers, uh, lingua franca as a contact language was kind of on a spectrum with Creole languages as formed and inherited languages or, or languages spoken by a second and third generation. 
in a new place. And they didn't make, though today linguistics would make a distinction between lingua franca as a vehicular contact language um, and uh, creoles as a inherited language. It becomes the mother tongue of groups who are born in spaces and so on. Actually, in the initial phases um, where these languages were coming under academic scrutiny uh, and taxonomy, there was actually a very Creole impulse to not have these strict demarcations and see more a kind of linguistic spectrum on which all these varieties of contact attempts were placed. And um, in my own work on this set of Creole, uh, like, pioneers of creolistics, you can call them, I'm actually proposing that they were on the right track and we should perhaps reintroduce these fuzzy boundaries and, and, and spec ideas of spectrum, the shades and grades of, of possibilities uh, into our thinking about creolization rather than think about strict boundaries. And so we kind of re-creolize Creole itself is the way I end that little piece I've been writing this uh, month. Uh, so I think uh, all these examples help us understand, uh, again, uh, how creolization has certainly its limits, but also opens up new possibilities uh, through, uh, it, through the material we are glimpsing here, uh, both the imaginative work done by the novelists and also the worlds they're seeking to capture. So, so it's, it's been really wonderful. Um, so, so happy to have, uh, you know, been taken away <laughs> to the Andamans by you, Arunima. There's a, there's a different question by uh, Ruth saying, like, you know, and that is exactly oh, the yes, question is, that yes. I ask to, yes. uh, you know, these authors. I have been in, I mean, I've done short interviews with two or three of them. And that is the first question I ask as to why suddenly Andaman Islands and why suddenly within this short period of time, I'm yet to arrive to a proper answer to give you. But that's that's definitely the first <laughs> question I ask them and ask, you know, others as well. So. Well, I think that right the basis, that so-called simple question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's not. Really, it's not. <laughs> and actually, I think it is the heart of a whole new research project because it is, a, it is, it is actually a simple and yet a most deep question, which I think, uh, again... And that's the first have, question. Like, it has to be the first question. And we are waiting for the answer, Rinema. <laughs> you are looking to you. <laughs> <laughs> to to help us get there so good luck with the with the project which will surely um, will surely unfold such answers to us in the fullness of time and we can already see how how we are going to get there so so thanks so much um thank you to you luca i'll leave it to you to wrap things up oh yes uh, thank you thank you so much to to Abunima, of course and to ananya and everyone uh it's been a very engaging uh, discussion. Um, and I think, you know, I also, of course, I always also had my notes, but I kind of keep, you know, I keep myself restrained for others to speak, but Arunima, we must meet uh, <laughs> and uh, exhaust all of my questions. Um, I think uh, we can say that uh, the, the way in which our conversation was going to at the end, especially on the questions of languages, we were focusing among the many, many, many things that uh, Abrunima uh, put us on the table today, uh, links us quite perfectly with the, at least with the title of the other, of the last, I think, for this uh, semester seminar that we are organizing, um, taking us to a different geography, that of the Lakshadweep. Um, and, uh, but it is on the languages of transactions in Lakshadweep uh, by Mahmoud Kuria presented by Mahmoud Kuria. So I would invite you all to join us on uh, our last seminar for this uh, semester and I think also academic year um, uh, on the 31st of March. So Thursday, 31st of March. Uh, between now and then, we can probably keep our sort of our thinking growing about languages, continent languages, languages of transactions, Creole, um, and then maybe we can have a a chunky discussion at the end to celebrate <laughs> all of the different directions that we've traversed uh, this uh, this year with these seminars. So thank you so much, Arunima. Thank you, everybody. And we hope to meet you, you soon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot, Luca. And thanks, Arunima. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank bye you, bye. everyone. Bye.